in the Vumba Mountains near Amtali, overlooking the Mozambique border, stands the Vumba National Park. Until recently privately owned, the park has one of the most beautiful displays of flowers and shrubs, both indigenous and imported, in the country. But these beautiful gardens have recently acquired a new inhabitant. While the warden of the park, Mr. D.G. Montgomery, goes about his duties, clinging to his shirt is a baby Samango monkey, Coco. Coco, one of a pair of twins, should have been clinging to his mother, who panicked when she was disturbed by children and ran away with one of her babies, leaving Coco behind. But the children brought Coco back to Mr. Montgomery, and now Coco refuses to be parted from his human foster father. If Mr. Montgomery walks away from him, Coco runs crying after him like a baby, begging to be picked up. At night, Coco sleeps in a basket with a hot water bottle in front of a fire in the lounge. Although he's most of his milk teeth now, Coco still cannot eat solids and must be fed on a diet of milk with a little corn flour and sugar. And he's doing very nicely too. Out of tragedy comes a fairy tale ending for Coco, who will never lack friends at his new home in the Vumba. Since the opening of the Rhodes National Gallery six years ago under its energetic director Frank McEwan, the Federation has witnessed what might best be described as a local renaissance in the visual arts. Sculptors like Salisbury's Lorraine Edelstein are turning out a remarkable number of interesting works. Wood carving and sculpture are traditional amongst the African people. Bernard Manyanduri of Inyanga has already achieved an enviable reputation as a sculptor, although he's completely self-taught. Thomas Mukorobwa is head attendant at the gallery, but manages to get in a few strokes on his canvas in between keeping a watchful eye on the public. A unique and exciting adventure was the establishment at the gallery 12 months ago of a workshop school where students are given free tuition. Charles Fernando, who is a jazz musician and gets his inspiration from jazz music, has had outstanding successes with his abstracts. Roy Thompson Holland works in the contemporary style at the workshop school. Here, a seemingly shapeless piece of wood begins to take shape and becomes recognizable as, well, let's wait and see. From Renaissance to a virile adolescence, and Rhodesia for the first time exports a major exhibition to London. The crowd gathers outside the art gallery in the Commonwealth Institute's new building to watch the arrival of Princess Margaret on this important occasion. The new Art from Rhodesia exhibition was only the second to be held in the new gallery, the first being, appropriately, a cross-section of art from the whole Commonwealth. The exhibition attracted a good deal of attention from London's art lovers. Salisbury's controversial Tom Maybank went over, as did gallery director Frank McEwan. Pictures which caught the royal visitor's eye were Charles Fernando's cymbal sound and clarinet trance. Other highlights were Yolam Likoto's striking head of the old Molozzi, the Rain Edelstein sea creature, two paintings by Tian Papenfuss, and this head by Manyanduri, all signs of the coming of age of art in Rhodesia. George Hodkinson of Luantia has a rather unusual hobby which could make him very popular. He makes wine from fruit. Any type of fruit which is edible will do, he says, oranges, strawberries, guavas, and even root vegetables such as carrots, parsnips, and beetroot. First step, squeeze the juice out in a homemade press. Now the juice is strained to get rid of any fruit pulp which may have got through.
This is the only really technical part of the process, measuring the specific gravity of the juice with an hydrometer. This determines the eventual alcoholic content of the wine. In goes the hydrometer, and it shows that this juice will produce 5% alcohol. Mm, not nearly enough. So, back in the bucket it goes, pour in 3 to 4 pounds of sugar. And in this way, the alcoholic strength can be increased to a maximum of 15%. Twelve percent, that's better. Now, some yeast spread on a piece of floating toast. Yes, that's right, floating toast. A polythene cover, and all that remains now is for the yeast to do its job of fermentation. Great care should be taken not to spill any. One can lose a lot of friends that way. Ordinary kitchen utensils are all that's necessary in the way of equipment and the only expense incurred is for the sugar and a spoonful of yeast, provided you grow your own fruit, of course. In the kitchen are several other jars of wine and beer with fermentation locks on them. If there's no outlet for air, a messy explosion could occur. When the wine is ready, fermentation takes three weeks to three months, depending on the type of wine. It's bottled and professional-looking labels and corks attached. Hmm, quite a collection. George Hodkinson holds a wine and cheese party once a month when friends and fellow winemakers gather to taste each other's brew, to swap information from their experience, and most important, to pass judgment on the latest batch. Our cameraman, believing that you can't film a subject unless you know something about it, joined in the wine tasting. Hmm, not bad, not too strong. Whoops, must take this camera in for servicing. This squad of 14 girls has just completed its two-month training course at the depot in Salisbury to swell the ranks of the BSAP Women Police to 32. Apart from routine square bashing, the girls spend a lot of time in the lecture rooms. After all, you can't catch criminals if you don't know what to look for. That plant produces dacha, or Indian hemp. The girls must become familiar with the various types of narcotics they're likely to encounter in the course of their duties. Here, they're taught to recognize a homemade still used for brewing illicit liquor, and are shown how it works. to the pistol range, where the girls learn to defend themselves against possible armed criminals. Chivalry towards the alleged weaker sex is not a notable characteristic of the felon, so the girls get a grounding in judo. Brute strength is no match for the person skilled in this art. It's all a question of timing and balance. With this hand and arm lock, the policewoman could disarm the strongest man. And now it's scaling the bars, or fences if you like, something similar to the training given to wartime commandos. Basketball keeps the girls fit, but it is mainly for recreation. Life-saving plays an important part in the training of all police. Here, the recruit has to dive into the water, fully clothed, to rescue a simulated drowning case, also fully clothed, as they might both be in real life. The victim is ashore, alive but unconscious, and the girls go to work on resuscitating her. And then it's on to the information room of the main police station where the girls learn how to send and receive messages to police cars on the radio transmitters and how to channel the information received. On their skill and efficiency might depend the apprehension of a dangerous criminal or the saving of someone's life.
there's a party to celebrate the end of a tough but enjoyable two-month course. And the girls are now fully-fledged policewomen. Top recruit was Miss J. James, with Miss Cynthia Ellis occupying second place. There are still a few vacancies on the strength, so girls, if you want to have a good time, be a policeman.